the great respect that I have for your leadership, Mr. President, uh, in this little understood, unfamiliar war, the first war of the 21st century. Uh, it is not well known. It was not well understood. It is complex for people to comprehend. And I know with certain certainty that over time, the contributions you've made will be recorded by history. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces, national security and military operations, discrimination. The administration never asked for an estimate or community assessment of Iraq. This regime aids. تمنى نطالب بأدام الإرهابية التكفيرية الأمريكية التي ألقي عليها القمر واعترفت أمام الجميع وأمام كل من شاهدهم نطالب بأعدامهم فورا بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد On May 1, 2003, President George W. Bush declared an end to major combat operations in Iraq and said, In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. Four years later, after over 3,000 American deaths and over 20,000 American wounded, Iraq has disintegrated into chaos. Baghdad has 10, uh, 10 bombings, 10, 15 bombings a day, and it's maybe uh, 50 KIA, but I suspect that's uh, drastically underreported. We probably capture a third of what's actually occurring. Millions of Iraqis have lost access to drinking water, sewage treatment, and electricity since the invasion. Baghdad, a city of six million, has been under an 8 p.m. curfew since March of 2006. Over three million Iraqis have fled to neighboring countries. Estimates of the civilian death toll range as high as 600,000. People who, uh, who die, they're lucky. But people living, they're dead while they're alive. The west part and the north part of Iraq are controlled by uh, insurgents. The rest of Iraq 
is controlled by uh, militias. Iraq's two major Muslim groups, the Shiite majority and Sunni minority, are increasingly at war. From January 2003 to January 2005, I was chairman of the National Intelligence Council. We produced the first national estimate on the state of the insurgency in, in Iraq. The estimate delivered pretty bad news. It basically laid out sort of bad, worse, and worst scenarios. The president called it guesswork, and his uh, press spokesman called it uh, hand-wringing and naysaying. Um, what was really revealing to me was the president hadn't read it. September 11th of 2001 was a very clear, bright, beautiful day. And I had just come back from the Pentagon barber shop, walked by my office and glanced up on the television screen and there was uh, one of the Twin Towers burning. We never heard the plane come in, at least I didn't. Uh, suddenly the whole world turned upside down. I saw that fireball and I gotta tell you, I saw that and I said to myself, I'm going to die today. That plane had come directly under our, our section of the offices. The Army Budget Office, where 38 uh, Army employees were killed, was directly beneath us. And the Navy's new command center was two floors beneath us. Everybody was killed in those two sections. This was something that Osama bin Laden had to orchestrate because he was the only terrorist I could think of who could have coordinated this kind of activity. Well, so you had that thought immediately. Immediately, immediately. A month after September 11th, the United States entered Afghanistan in search of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. But even before the Afghan war, several senior administration officials were looking at another target, one that had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks. When the planes hit the Pentagon, I was in the building. And then, I guess the next big thing that started to happen was we uh, immediately got tasked to see if we could draw any relationship between Saddam and Al-Qaeda. I went uh, right away to the, to the uh, counterterrorism group, uh, to their chief Iraq analyst. And the two of us sat down over a few days and looked at all the historical reporting that we could go through. And what did you conclude? Well, we concluded that there was no relationship. His regime aids and protects terrorists, including members of Al-Qaeda. We continue to watch Iraq's involvement in terrorist activities. What I want to bring to your attention today is the potentially much more sinister nexus between Iraq and the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. We don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. Iraq has drones, and they're going to take these drones, and they're going to put them on these ships, and they're going to arm the drones with uh, chemical, biological weapons, and they're going to fly these drones off the ships and attack the east coast of the United States. You know, this is absolute fantasy land. These people are... Uh, I don't know what they were smoking, but it uh, must have been very good. George W. Bush's foreign policy inner circle, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Wolfowitz, set the administration on course for war with Iraq. Condoleezza Rice sided with them. Colin Powell and Richard Armitage, the only senior officials with combat experience, expressed concerns privately, but supported the administration in public. Bush's advisors had been involved with Saddam Hussein since he invaded Iran in 1980. 
In a brutal war that killed nearly a million people, Iraq used chemical weapons against both the Iranian military and innocent civilians. Saddam invested billions of dollars in nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons programs while murdering 300,000 of his own citizens. But the Reagan administration, fearing Iran, supported Saddam with military intelligence and economic aid. Donald Rumsfeld met with Saddam in 1983. Colin Powell was Reagan's national security advisor from 1987 to 1989. It's really summed up in a, in a, in a dreadful uh, but very, very telling State Department document uh, from 1987, which said, human rights and chemical weapons use aside, comma, <laughs> Our interests run roughly parallel to those of Iraq. The Iran-Iraq war ends in stalemate in 1988. In 1990, Saddam invades Kuwait. A US-led coalition expels him in a war masterminded by Dick Cheney, then Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, then Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, and Colin Powell, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The first President Bush urges Iraqis to stage a coup against Saddam. There's another way for the bloodshed to stop, and that is for the Iraqi military and the Iraqi people to take matters into their own hands and force Saddam Hussein, the dictator, to step aside. Yet when Iraq's southern Shiites rise up, the administration allows Saddam to repress them. 14 out of Iraq's 18 governorates were under rebel control when General Schwarzkopf allowed Saddam Hussein to use helicopter gunships to massacre the rebels, men, women, and children. The 1991 armistice requires Iraq to disarm, but Saddam refuses to comply. As a result, Iraq's economy crumbles under a UN embargo instituted in 1993 and continued by the Clinton administration. Saddam's favored elite remain wealthy, but ordinary Iraqis are plunged into extreme poverty and many turn to fundamentalist Islam. In 1993, when George Bush Sr. visits Kuwait, Saddam attempts to assassinate him. Seven years later, his son is elected president of the United States. When you see the same architects of those policies, on the one hand, talking about getting right what they had gotten wrong back in 1991, you know, finishing the job, it was tempting to say, well, well maybe they've learned. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict commenced at a time of our choosing. If you want to date the beginning of the disaster of post-war Iraq, it would be January 20th, 2003, when Bush signed without, as far as I can tell, any real discussion within the White House or the administration, National Security Presidential Directive Number 24, which gave control of post-war Iraq to the Pentagon. That document essentially made Donald Rumsfeld the main actor on post-war Iraq. This war was conceived by a very small group of people inside the, administra the Bush administration. They had an entirely uh, naive uh, vision of what Iraq was and what Iraqis would do once the regime uh, fell. In formulating its views on post-Saddam Iraq, the administration relied heavily on a man named Ahmed Chalabi. Since 1992, Chalabi had been president of the Iraqi National Congress, or INC. Widely viewed with suspicion, Chalabi had been convicted in Jordan of a huge bank fraud. The intelligence community found his information unreliable or even fraudulent. At best, I think uh, they were liars, and at worst, they were provocateurs. If it's an INC source, it was always looked at very, very skeptically by the analysts, but that wasn't the case with the policymakers. Chalabi asserted that post-war Iraq would be pro-American and easily stabilized, particularly if Chalabi himself was in charge. And so the plan was essentially, we'll stay for three or four months, we will install a government made up of exiles and led by Ahmed Chalabi, and then in August or September of 2003, we will begin a um, drastic reduction of troops. Larry Dorita addressed us in one form and said by the end of August of 2003, we will have all but 
25 to 30,000 troops out of Iraq. I heard him say that in a room full of people. And I turned to my colleagues and I said, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. It's physically impossible. The State Department's Future of Iraq Project, a 13-volume study on post-war Iraq, was ignored by the Pentagon. There was an awful lot of thinking at the State Department. There are bored feet of volumes uh, on you know, how we should do this. But almost none of this was integrated into the Pentagon's thinking. Secretary's frustration, um, along with my own, grew as we watched our careful planning, our detailed planning, essentially discarded, and the people who've been involved in it essentially discarded, so that more uh, loyal, in line with the Republican Party's views and so forth, people could be appointed to key positions in, in Iraq. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. I joined the Marines because I think I've always just felt it's a really important job and I didn't feel like I'd be content with myself going through life knowing that other people had fought for my freedom. I joined the Army to, to uh, support my country and uh, I just thought it was a good thing to do, you know. It was uh, an honor to go there and help my fellow soldiers to do what they told us to go and do there. Maybe take out a dictator out of the power to reestablish the democracy. I just was waiting for the war to happen because it was the only ray of hope I, uh, I had to look for. Um, and when it happened, I was uh, excited and uh, that things will move slowly but um, towards uh, better circumstances. Thank you, Mr. It was just a confusing, loud, noisy, scary, hopeful place, all kind of wrapped up together. I would see kids with ski caps on that said FBI across it. Uh, and they would be giving me the big thumbs up. And then I would have other young men who were probably fedayeen in civilian clothes giving me very hard stares and, and, you know, kind of sizing me up and always kind of looking at the license plate of the car. The Iraqis were waiting to see what this was going to bring them. The presence of the Americans had not been rejected yet by the Iraqis. No, 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 no. I've seen people welcoming the uh, coalition troops because we thought everything is planned, everything is prepared. There you go. During World War II, the United States started planning the occupation of Germany two years in advance. But the Bush administration didn't create the organization that would manage the occupation of Iraq until 60 days before the invasion. Orha the Organization for Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance reported directly to Defense Secretary Rumsfeld. I got a call from the Office of Secretary of Defense in late January, and they would like for me to handle humanitarian affairs, reconstruction. Retired Army General Jay Garner was appointed to run ORHA. In the first Gulf War, he had commanded 22,000 soldiers responsible for humanitarian operations in the Kurdish zone of northern Iraq. This time, he would be running the entire country. Did you think that you were prepared to run Iraq? Oh, I don't think we were ever prepared. I mean, it, it, you know, to a uh, uh, task of that magnitude probably takes years to prepare, but of course nobody had years. I got a phone call on my cell phone from someone at the State Department telling me that Rich Armitage was looking for me and wanted me back in Washington right now. Ambassador Barbara Bodine was placed in charge of Baghdad only three weeks before the war.
She was a career foreign service officer who had served in Yemen, Iraq, and had been a hostage in Kuwait for five months after Saddam's invasion in 1990. She was one of the few State Department Mideast experts that the Pentagon allowed into Iraq. She was one of the few we could get in. I thought they uh, initially made a mistake. They thought they had a woman and she'd be an easy mark, but Barbara was one of the toughest members of the service. By 2003, Army Colonel Paul Hughes had worked in the Pentagon for six years doing planning and strategy work for senior Defense Department officials. I wound up being assigned to the um, Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance under Jay Garner, and I was the director of strategic policy for him. We were given a suite of offices that had been unoccupied for a couple of years, uh, had no computers in it. You have people showing up daily asking, where do I sit? They had no staff. Um, I had no personnel. I had, I had nothing from either a senior deputy down to a, a secretary. There was only one meeting at the National Defense University, and it was the, I think, the consensus opinion of the people who went to that meeting with whom I spoke afterwards um, that, hey, this is crazy. Uh, that was our first meeting, and we're not given a whole lot of confidence by that first meeting because, essentially, we didn't do anything except meet each other. It was completely unstructured. Um, there were no plans, and there truly were no plans. On the 16th of March, Orha flew out to Kuwait City. We had 167 people that flew with us, 167 people that were to essentially become the government of a country of 25 million. Whoa. After the fall of Baghdad, we had no idea what really was going to happen, and there certainly didn't seem to be much of a plan. What we're generally being told is that we'd be getting back on the ships, you know, within a month or two of essentially conquering Iraq. While we were in Kuwait, we were as glued to the television set as, as everyone else. There was the realization that there was absolute lawlessness and chaos going on in Iraq. The Americans weren't doing anything. They, they would sit at certain intersections, but they wouldn't actually get out of the Humvees or out of the tanks and, and really do much. Time passed and we didn't see any progress. The only progress we found is the uncontrolled freedom looters had to loot all the governmental buildings and even private-owned companies. The looting was partly a factor of the troop levels and the sense that Rumsfeld communicated to his commanders and his commanders communicated down the chain to the platoon and company level that we were not there to run Iraq. We were there to get rid of the regime and get out. We're not under martial law here. In his order, General McKiernan was not told to establish martial law. You know, not once was martial law declared. I'll just, I'll tell you honestly, we're in a transition period. I mean, there is an Iraqi civil law, but there's no, you just heard that we just opened up the, the first two courts today. So, I, I mean, when you're, you're starting at nothing. Had martial law been declared, which would have been uh, authorized under the Fourth Geneva Convention, maybe we would have had a bit more security. We're a platoon of Marines. I mean, we could, we could certainly stop looting if, we, if, we, if that was our assigned task. The greatest mystery of post-war Iraq involves that month or so after the fall of Baghdad of why the U.S. didn't do anything to control the looting because, in a way, Everything that's been a problem since then started in that first month. People at the National Security Council, Secretary Powell, myself, and others, uh, CIA director, did express concern about the looting. Uh, did you express any concern to President Bush? Uh, I was at a meeting where it was expressed by my boss. Tell me what Mr. Powell said at that meeting. Well, you know, that's not the way we generally work. Our advice to the president is generally kept that way, private to the president. The word came from Washington that we're not getting involved in that. We're not, we're not going to stop the looting. We're not doing police work. That's not what we're here for. And I think... So there were explicit instructions from Washington to not interfere with the looting? Yes. Hospitals, 
government offices, universities, ministries. One CPA estimate had the cost of the looting at $12 billion. That was the revenue for Iraq in 2003-2004. I picked up a newspaper today, and I couldn't believe it. I read eight headlines that talked about chaos, violence, unrest, and it just was henny penny, the sky is falling. Just imagine the room, the suite that we're sitting in, and all that you have is concrete walls. Everything is gone. We're talking people coming in with, with industrial cranes and walking off with parts of a power plant. Think what's happened in our cities when we've had riots and problems and looting. Stuff happens. This was not just people stealing stuff from grocery stores. I mean, this was people chipping concrete walls into little pieces so they could take the rebar out. The images you are seeing on television, you are seeing over and over and over, and it's the same picture of some person walking out of some building with a vase. I think that was probably the day that we lost the Iraqis. And you think, my goodness, were there that many vases? <laughs> uh, is, is it possible that there were that many vases in the whole country? That's when it became very clear that this liberation really didn't have anything to do with the average Iraqi. And there was a belief that the Americans actually encouraged the looting or wanted it to happen. Um, the destruction of our country, how could they let this happen? So whether you were Sunni or Shia, you were outraged about the looting. We had done a list of 20 sites that we thought needed to be protected, um, historical, cultural, artistic, religious, and we had provided that, and it, it really made no difference whatsoever. The Iraq National Museum in Baghdad, number one on Orha's list, contained some of the world's most important artifacts of early human civilization. The museum was never protected. Iraq's National Library and National Archives, containing thousands of ancient manuscripts, were burnt down. All what are written or what were written are kept in this library. Now we have no national heritage. Three days ago, me and Dr. Jabir Khalil, chairman of the State Board of Antiquities, went to the headquarters of the Marines in Palestine Hotel. We waited there for about four hours till we met a colonel there. And at that day, he promised that he will send armored cars to protect what's left from the museum. Three days ago, till now, Nobody came. To try to lay off the fact of that unfortunate uh, activity uh, on, on a defect in a war plan, it strikes me as a stretch. Well, weren't you urged specifically by uh, scholars and uh, others about the danger to that museum? And weren't you urged to provide a greater level of pr protection and security in the initial phases of the operation? Not to my knowledge. No one can claim that they were caught by surprise by the looting. I just don't think they wanted to know. They didn't want to hear it. In the months leading up to the invasion, a debate over troop levels required in Iraq had been privately brewing between the military leadership and Donald Rumsfeld. Rumsfeld and his deputy, Paul Wolfowitz, believed that a force of under 100,000 troops would be sufficient for the invasion and occupation of Iraq. A month before the invasion, the fight over troop levels became public as the chief of staff of the army, Eric Shinseki, testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee, ignoring pressure from Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz. General Shinseki, uh, could you give us some ideas to the magnitude of the Army's force requirement uh, for an occupation of Iraq? Something on the order of several hundred thousand uh, soldiers are, are, are probably uh, you know, a figure that uh, would be uh, required. What is 
I think reasonably certain is, the idea that it would take several hundred thousand U.S. forces, I think, is far from the mark. It's hard to conceive that it would take more forces to provide stability in post-Saddam Iraq than it would take to conduct the war itself and to secure the surrender of Saddam's security forces in his army. Hard to imagine. Hard to imagine. Anyone who had any experience in the interventions of the 90s knew that the opposite was true. You need X number of soldiers per thousand citizens simply to provide a, a modicum of security. But Paul Wolfowitz couldn't imagine it. Uh, we're talking about post hostilities, control over a, a piece of geography that's uh, fairly significant with uh, uh, the kinds of ethnic tensions that could lead to uh, uh, other uh, problems, and so it takes a significant ground force presence. Did General Shinteki get it right? He was asked for his best military opinion, and his experience exceeds mine. He commanded our forces in Bosnia. He did it for uh, a year plus. He knows what he's talking about. Secretary Powell, and uh, to the same extent, uh, myself, uh, we argued for more and more troops, and we made uh, some difference, but ultimately it uh, didn't seem that we made enough of a difference. Personally, I feel that the war would be going differently if you had um, leadership that really understood, number one, what it's like to be on the ground, had actually served in the armed forces. And uh, number two, really had a good um, managerial grasp of, of making this, this thing work. The senior administration officials who overruled the military and State Department had no experience with post-war reconstruction efforts and little or no military experience. Cheney had avoided military service during Vietnam through five draft deferments. Rumsfeld was a Navy pilot in the 1950s, but had never seen combat. Wolfowitz and Rice had never served in the military. Bush had avoided the Vietnam draft by joining the Texas Air National Guard. He also had no foreign policy experience prior to becoming president. We're looking at it, I say we, those of us who had military experience, and we would talk about this often, um, this doesn't look good. In mid-April 2003, with looting still underway, Rumsfeld canceled deployment of the 1st Cavalry Division, a force of 16,000 soldiers. It shocked us. Uh, how can you turn off that division? If we had had that division following us into Iraq, we would have stabilized a lot more of Iraq just through our presence. On April 19th, Orha finally entered Iraq to begin post-war operations. Of the 20 ministries we want to bring back, 16 of those buildings were destroyed as a, pro as a function of looting. We were starting from zero. I mean, if there are no desks and there are no chairs, there are no typewriters left, where do we go and meet the Iraqis to start working? There was no structure left, um, physical structure or bureaucratic structure. I had to put people out on the street walking around asking, do you know anybody that's in the ministry? Do you know the people that are in the Ministry of Health? Do you know the people that are in the Ministry of Interior? Do you know the pe people in the Ministry of Education? Within the group itself, we had, I think, probably five who spoke any amount of Arabic. We had no phone lists. We had no phones for a while, so I guess having no phone list was not really that important. We had no information. We had no place to go. We didn't know who to contact. Um, not the best way to, not the best way to start an occupation. And what followed was this pervasive sense of lawlessness that Iraq never recovered from. And the guys with guns took over, and they were the Iraqi guys with guns. The firefights I got caught up in were not firefights where Americans were being attacked. It was Iraqi on Iraqi firefights. You'd just be driving down the street and suddenly there's a fusillade of fire that just opens up on you. And you're just in the middle of these guys shooting at each other. The streets were chaotic. People could kill and get away with it. There was no working police force. Just prior to the, uh, the invasion, Saddam released about 100,000 prisoners, common criminals from the jails. In uh, February of uh, 2003, I got an invitation to come and brief advisory panel that advised the Secretary Rumsfeld on 
on defense policy matters. What I told them was that based on our experiences in previous peace operations and on what had happened in Iraq historically, it was very likely that if the U.S. intervened and captured Baghdad that we were likely to face massive civil disturbance. I suggested that we needed about 2,500 constabulary forces, about 4,000 civil police, street cops, and then teams of judicial advisors and corrections officers. In the end, they agreed that, well, this was a good idea. There wasn't enough time, but maybe for the next war. Prior to the war, the Baghdad morgue received one murder case a month. Within a month, they were getting about 25 a day. And they were seeing rapes often for the first time, rapes and murders. Iraqi girls were being kidnapped. So Iraqi women disappeared from the streets. They stopped going to school. They stopped driving. The Americans were not acting as the police. And they didn't know the streets of Baghdad. They didn't speak the language. They didn't have interpreters in sufficient numbers. And they didn't have intelligence about what was going on. So it was a free-for-all. And you just felt, oh, there's a, there's a void here. Very quickly, the Musk came in and filled in the, the vacuum that the Americans created by getting rid of Saddam and leaving nothing in its place. In Shia neighborhoods, they very quickly established control, in particular the clerics associated with Muqtada Sadr. Muqtada al-Sadr was the son of a famous Shiite cleric and started a bid for power based on his father's network of mosques and charities. Only a few days after American troops entered Baghdad, he assassinated a pro-American Shiite leader. Then he began creating a heavily armed militia, the Mahdi Army, which took over Baghdad's Shiite ghetto and much of southern Iraq. If you tended to the issues of policing, if there hadn't been the looting, then you wouldn't have had people turning to sectarian militias as their sources of neighborhood uh, security. Orha worked on recalling the Iraqi military to deal with the security vacuum. The Army Central Command, CENTCOM, supported this policy. What CENTCOM had done, they had factored into their planning the bringing back of the Iraqi army. They used the Iraqi army to seal the borders, to provide static security things, and also help in the reconstruction of their own nation. Rumsfeld called him and he said, hey Jay, you're, I want to call you, I like everything that's going on, you're doing a great job, you and your team, glad you're now in Baghdad and all that. And by the way, the president is appointing a Jerry Bremer as the presidential envoy. Bremer was a former foreign service officer. Like most officials sent to Iraq, Bremer did not speak Arabic, had no previous experience with the Mideast or post-war reconstruction, and had never served in the military. After Bremer's arrival, Orha would be phased out, and the Coalition Provisional Authority, CPA, would take its place. We intend to have a very uh, effective, efficient, and well-organized handover. Uh, General Garner and I are pledged to working very closely together. He's done an outstanding job. We set up a series of briefings for him. He spent a day going through what everybody was doing, and then he took charge. I came home like 3rd or 4th or 5th of June. Between May 1st and his departure for Iraq on May 10th, Bremer worked at the Pentagon and met frequently with Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz, and Undersecretary Doug Fife. Bremer also worked closely with Walter Slocum, a former Undersecretary of Defense whom Rumsfeld had appointed to be in charge of post-war policy for Iraq's military. They contacted me in mid-March of 2003. Did it cross your mind to think, you know, isn't it kind of late for them to be thinking about this? Yes. Did you tell him that? No. Like Bremer, Slocum had never served in the military, had never been to Iraq, had no post-war reconstruction experience, and spoke no Arabic. In Bremer's first 10 days at work, while still in Washington, D.C., he made three fateful policy decisions. His first decision was to stop the formation of an interim Iraqi government, even though Jay Garner had been working to establish one. 
Jay Garner was certainly supportive of. They get some governing body of Iraqis, but uh, this was uh, done away with on the way to Baghdad. And uh, I didn't think General Garner knew about it beforehand, and nor did uh, I. We had expected, uh, and I think I can say we had been promised, uh, that there would be a sovereign government virtually immediately. I'm in charge, and everyone will do what I say, and that's it. Understand? And that's kind of the way uh, L. Paul Brimmer came across. Much, much, much too hardcore and too mission-driven to see that his exclusion of the Iraqis early on from major participation in the decision-making process was a grievous error. In uh, May of 2003, we got the the legal occupation of Iraq. I said at that time, and I believe now, that that was a mistake. We want the American troops basically to leave Iraq completely and let the Iraqi people basically to rule Iraq. The reaction to his next two decisions would be dramatically worse. Debathification. I am today establishing an Iraqi debathification council to ensure that the structure and influence of the Ba'ath Party is eliminated for good. Bremer's second decision, his first formal order as head of the CPA, purged an estimated 50,000 members of the Ba'ath Party, which Saddam had used to rule Iraq. For most, Bremer's order meant permanent unemployment. The policy also crippled Iraq's government, educational system, and economy, because it purged senior government officials who had joined the party simply to survive under Saddam's regime. I was walking down the hall and Ambassador Robin Rafel came to me and said, have you seen this? And I said, what is it, Robin? She said, it's the debathification war. I said, no. So I read it real quick and I said, I, I, it's, I don't think we can do this. She said, well, I think you ought to go talk to Jerry. So we went to see him and I said, uh, how about letting us go through this and let's get on the phone with Rumsfeld and see if we can soften this a little bit. And he said, no, I don't, I don't have that flexibility. I've been given my orders and I'm going to execute them. So that ended that discussion. He may have come in and spoken to me at great length about it. I just don't remember it, honestly don't remember it. You don't remember these guys coming in and saying, this it is 30 to 50,000 people, and my God, what are you doing? I just, yeah. you know, I was working 20 hours a day in that period as well, and this wasn't the only thing on my list of things to do the first five days I was there. Bremer appointed Ahmed Chalabi to head the Debathification Council. Chalabi used the position to eliminate political rivals. Debathification was so deep that uh, we weren't able to get the government running as efficiently as we should have, as fast as we should have, and you had a lot of disenfranchised uh, Baathists. There were people who were kicked out of their jobs, even though they were just professionals, engineers, uh, directors. The technocrats, uh, the intelligentsia, the elementary school librarian. Being conquered and then losing your job and, and not having any means to support yourself or your family was an incredibly humiliating experience. It was Bremer's third decision, however, that was the most explosive. Disbanding the Iraqi military and intelligence services, the most important institutions in Iraq, CPA Order No. 2 disbanded the Iraqi Army, Republican Guard, Special Republican Guard, and Secret Police. Overnight, Bremer rendered unemployed and thereby infuriated half a million armed men, equivalent to firing over five million people in the United States. And so these men, rather than helping to prevent an insurgency, instead created one. I can't believe they did that. Hundreds of thousands of families depended on the army. They didn't have an income. They didn't have providers. We very hungry. No bread, no food, no money. We want jobs. Children, uh, women, wives, uh, sisters, fathers uh, stopped eating because they didn't have enough money. Officially, I think it's 27% unemployment. Officially, it's pr it's almost certainly much higher. Uh, I would guess anywhere from 40 to 50 percent. Is it any wonder that many of these people who were military, who almost all had at least some military training since you had to serve in the army in Iraq, uh, or they were active military, uh, would turn to joining the insurgency uh, just as a means to feed their family and as a means of regaining some of that pride. <laughs> 
In deciding to disband the Iraqi military, Bremer was undoing a policy supported by both the U.S. military and by Orha. Paul Hughes had a team that was seeking out the Iraqi army, and he was beginning to find a lot of them, and he had found a lot of them, and we had made overtures to bring them back. These soldiers, when they registered, had to sign uh, or fill out a questionnaire about who they were, what unit they were with, what they did, what their skills were, what military equipment they had at home, what j just a, a, a lot of information that would have been useful to us. And I was collecting all of that. But the DOD advisory team in charge of dealing with the Iraqi military, headed by Walter Slocum, had remained in Washington, D.C. and had never visited Iraq. I said, I don't see any reason to go out there. I can get ready better here in Washington. And I urged them time and again in my conversations with them from Baghdad that they needed to get over there because there were people waiting on them and on one man in particular to show up so he could make decisions and get the ball rolling. In his absence, I was left with the duty of having to deal with the Iraqi army just to keep contact with them. The Iraqi army was essentially standing there waiting. They were waiting for an overture. They were waiting for what they thought would happen, that someone would come to them and say, this is the plan, and you're integral to that plan, and we need you. No one ever did that. When the war was over, when the major maneuver fighting was over, there were simply no units still in existence. Everybody had gone home. Generals and commanders were coming back with entire divisions saying, here are my people. One of the Iraqi officers, towards the end of, I don't know, the second or third meeting, when Baghdad was going, it was in chaos, said, Colonel Paul, I can have 10,000 military policemen for you next week. You just tell me. I took that back to Bernie Carrick's staff and nothing was done with it. Five days after Bremer issued his order, we were farewelling Jay Garner because he was gonna leave Iraq for good the next day. We had two Humvees on the highway heading out from the green zone. Uh, they were ambushed and two soldiers were killed. And that was when, in my mind, the insurgency began. Go, go, go! Go! My colleagues and I could sit on the balcony or on the roof of the Republican Palace at night, and we could watch the tracers throughout Baghdad. We could watch the flares of different colors that went up, marking where American convoys of certain compositions were moving and being followed by the insurgents. These guys all knew where those munitions were. They knew how to get to those weapons and how to use them. And you've just sent them away and said they don't exist? Common sense tells me you don't do that. I mean, you had huge ammunition dumps that weren't guarded until uh, several weeks, if not a couple months, after major combat actions ended. I'm standing there watching these insurgents pull out rockets and mortars and bombs from these weapons caches that the Iraqis had store, you know, stashed everywhere. And you go to the British or to the US, whoever's there with your little GPS receiver and say, hey guys, you know, we found like 18,000 million tons of bombs and there are a bunch of Iraqis there with AK-47s taking it away. Probably not the best idea. Here's where it's located. And they say to you, we just don't have enough people to cover it. And it just, I couldn't believe it. It wasn't the right answer. Go there and take care of it for your security, for the civilian security, for everybody. It's just a bad idea. Did anybody warn you that disbanding the army in this way would and then was fueling major growth of the insurgency? Certainly not in those terms. Nobody said that to you? No, I also don't believe it's true, but nobody said it. Nobody said You don't believe it's true? No, I, also, I do not believe it's true. A number of the most senior generals uh, came 
to the Canal Hotel, to UN headquarters, and they were very explicit that the consequence of letting this order stand and of marginalizing this incredibly powerful segment of society would be an insurgency. A Lebanese um, a diplomat named Hassan Salami uh, turned to his colleague as the generals walked away after one of their meetings and said, um, I see bullets in their eyes. I see bullets in their eyes. Even more remarkable than the decision to disband the army was how that decision was made, secretly over a single week by a few men in Washington, D.C. who had never been to Iraq. They did not consult with the military commanders in Iraq, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, ORHA, the State Department, the CIA, the National Security Council, or even, apparently, the President of the United States. Walter Slocum and Paul Hughes were re-interviewed in order to reconstruct the events leading to the dissolution of the Army. These guys called themselves the Independent Military Gathering. The Independent Military Gathering had 100,000 on the 9th of May. And they already had 100,000 signatures? Yeah, uh, this was a nationwide effort. They brought me that uh, I wanted the printouts, I wanted their discs, and they gave them to me, and I took them back with me to Orha. I said, here we go. And I, and I told Walt and his crew, I've got these things. They're here waiting for you. Hughes believed that he had an, an, an opening to some Iraqi officers who would have been prepared to reconstitute units. I don't, he already I don't had obtained registration statements from 137,000. No, he, hadn't, he, hadn't, he, he hadn't done that. He may have, he may have re gotten, because nobody could have gotten statements from 130,000 anybody for anything in the chaos that prevailed at that point. They had a courier system set up that was running around the, the uh, metropolitan area of Baghdad, of Mosul, of uh, Basra, and Kirkuk. And I don't understand, I, I mean, I, given how difficult it was to do anything just operationally, organizationally, nobody had 137,000. Walt wasn't there. He never met with these people. He had no clue. So did you tell Slocum this, that this was going on? Yes, he knew this. He and his staff knew this. Ambassador Bremer, you had already made a recommendation to him, and he had already made at least a tentative recommendation to Secretary Rumsfeld about the dissolution of the Army. Um, well, about issuing the order that he finally issued, yeah. Yes, on May 9th. Yes. Okay. The 9th of May was the last time I had a conversation with uh, Walt Slocum. And we talked on the phone before I went out. Did you ever say to him, we're thinking of disbanding the Iraqi army and stopping your efforts to recall well, the Iraqi one army? Of the that, one of the things that we, I did was just... Did you ever say that to him? In those words, no. The conversation was, I'm coming over, I'm concerned about where I'm going to be living, you know, am I going to have a motor pool with me, my own cooks, yada, yada, yada. I mean, it was nothing about the Iraqi military. And I was giving him an update and on he, what... So he didn't say that he had already uh, come to the tentative conclusion and recommended to Bremer to dissolve the army? Absolutely not, because had he said that, I would have been on Jay's doorstep post-haste. So you guys came up with this idea and recommended to Secretary Rumsfeld without having spoken to any of the senior people in Iraq responsible for these matters? that it was subject to, and precisely because of the fact that it had it actually been only thought of for a few days because Bremer was going out and Bremer said to Rumsfeld, before I make a recommendation, I will talk to people on the ground. Was that a surprise to you? Had this been discussed with yeah, you? Yeah, it was, no, it hadn't been discussed with me. It was a surprise. It was a big surprise. Really? Mm -hmm. You never called up Garner and said, we're thinking of doing this. Do you think this is a good idea? I don't think I did. Don't you think that might have been a mistake? No. What was your reaction? What did you think? I thought it was a poor idea. I thought we needed to bring them back. John Abizay and Dave McKiernan were uh, constantly telling me, how about hurrying up, let's get the Army back, let's get the Army back. There is a large number of uh, former Iraqi soldiers that are unemployed now. Uh, that is a huge concern, not only from a security standpoint, but from an economic standpoint. They're, they're not earning an income right now. 
And there's the announcement that the Iraqi army has been disbanded. And I was floored. And at this particular point in time, Walt Slocum and his team still were not in Iraq. Colonel Hughes was the person who was in charge of dealing with the Iraqi army because none of the people from your advisory group had yet showed up in Iraq, including you. Uh, didn't you think that maybe you should speak with him about this? Oh, I talked with him a lot. That's funny. He says that the order expanding the army came as a complete surprise to him and that he learned of it by watching it on television in an airport. That's ex well, if that's so, that's surprising to me, but it's possible. Well, I talked to, I mean, I talked to him, I, we, we, we worked together on a daily basis during the time I was there. He came on the 16th of May, 16th of May. for a four-day whirlwind tour of the country. Oh. And then he left, and he didn't come back until the middle of June. Really? Correct. He didn't tell you that? This uh, idea to disband the entire army was one that came as quite a surprise to me. I see. What was your reaction when you learned of it? I thought we had just created a problem. We had a lot of out-of-work soldiers. The president had already made a different decision, which was to keep battalion and below in force. Earlier, yes. Yeah. Um, but well, within, I mean, in a couple of days' proximity. I think most of us were caught relatively unawares or completely unawares by this disbanding of the army. Secretary Powell found out about it, uh, as I did. Which was how? Just as we found out one day, Jerry announced that he disbanded the army. How about Condoleezza Rice? Oh, she'll have to speak for herself. Do you have any idea how much the president knew about these decisions in advance? Whether he... I, no, as I've said before, I don't know if he was informed by Mr. Rumsfeld or not. No idea. I wasn't in my office but two hours, and a young MP comes to see me, and he goes, Colonel Hughes, I got some Iraqi officers that want to meet with you. And I was thinking to myself, holy cow, what do I tell these guys? So I finally came downstairs and met with them in the rotunda of the Republican Palace. Colonel Mirjan says, Colonel Paul, what happened? And I said to him, I don't know what happened. I have no idea how this came about. And he said, all these soldiers, they now have no recourse. They have no money coming to them. What are they supposed to do? feel like that, you know, the conditions are such that they can attack us there. My answer is bring them on. I was in the bucket. The bucket is a non-armored vehicle. Anything that happened, you're going to get it. So nobody wants to be in there. I suffer the blast almost, almost directly, sir, of that blast. And then I came, I, I started hearing the firefight from the far to the closest. Blah, blah. We start firing. We have a limited problem of some bitter enders, some small remnants of the old regime who are using professional military tactics to attack and kill our soldiers as they did uh, this morning. So we you will, don't think this is a coordinated campaign? You no, don't there's believe no, this is a guerrilla no, war that no. suddenly we moved there's, into a there phase is, of guerrilla uh, war? As a consequence of that blast, I suffer a penetrating traumatic brain injury. And uh, I lost the perception of the light in my right eye. I suffer a pellet in my left eye that gets me a macular hole in the retina. Uh, but we fight. We fight until, until we hear the ceasefire. I was a gunner, and my driver lost both his legs, and it ejected me out. And um, I suffered a um, fractured femur, 
nearly lost my right arm and collapsed lung and um, closed head wounds. I have since gone to the dictionary and I have looked up several things, one of which I can't immediately recapture, but one was uh, guerrilla war, another was insurgency, another was uh, unconventional war. Pardon me? One black. <laughs> no, that's uh, someone else's business, quagmires. I don't do quagmires. A guy I know, he's a counterinsurgency expert. He was at the palace where the CPA is headquartered, and he was talking to an army colonel whose desk was right outside Bremer's office, and he said, he used the word insurgency, and the army colonel held up his hand and said, there is no insurgency in Iraq. There is a high level of domestic violence. The security problem increasingly ate into our ability to do our job. I had hoped to establish some neighborhood advisory councils. These three director generals gave probably the most coherent briefing on the structure and organization of a 1,500-year-old city that I think anyone could have gotten. One of them launched into this plan for neighborhood advisory groups. He had this whole grassroots, bottom-up democratization thing nailed. It was an absolutely beautiful plan. And what happened to it? He was assassinated. The country was slipping more and more out of control the entire time. And I think in some ways Bremer and his aides didn't know how bad things were getting outside the, the blast walls. Headquartered in Saddam's former Republican palace, the CPA compound called the Green Zone was shielded by seven miles of blast walls. There were huge lines of Iraqis, engineers, public officials, people just willing to help to translate, uh, standing in line at the gates of the palace, made to wait and not being received by anyone. Just told, go away, don't come back. These people came there and tried once and two times and three times, and then they gave up. I absolutely hated the Green Zone. I got out every chance I could to meet with Iraqis and sit in their homes and hear their complaints and their thoughts. And I would come back and tell Dan Sonor, you have a problem. You're not communicating to the Iraqis. Virtually nobody in the CPA and the senior, senior level spoke Arabic. One could count maybe five or six among, among the top 40, 50, 70 officials. We had regional experts who had served in uh, Iraq, but as has been documented, many of them were not uh, involved in the initial parts uh, after the invasion of Iraq and the initial occupation. So that expertise was lost. Tell us how your time there ended. Um, I understand it's a sensitive subject. Say what you're comfortable saying. Right. You know. um, well, I will say that it, it, it ended much sooner than I had anticipated, uh, and it ended much sooner than I, I, I would have wanted. Um, I really would have liked to have stayed and, and tried to have given all, given the frustrations and the limitations, it was still a very worthwhile place to be and a, and a worthwhile thing to be trying to do. Do you know why she was fired? Uh, I know why uh, I was told. Uh, was what was it? That she was difficult to get along with and she uh, was uh, offering opinions that were counter to the prevailing wisdom in Baghdad at the time. We were getting new people in after Bremer showed up. Kids, right out of college, you know. They'd have a baccalaureate degree, just got it the fall, their previous spring. Daddy made a contribution to the campaign, so the kid gets a chance to go over and experience some fun travel and adventure. Um, pretty boys, that's what I called them. They sat around Bremer's front door and did nothing. During the course of my time in, uh, in, in the, the Green Zone, when I was in the palace, I bumped into one of my students, just graduated. I asked her what she was doing, and uh, she said, well, she couldn't believe her luck. I'm being asked to, uh, to do the traffic plan for the city. And I, I asked her if she had any training in municipal planning, and she said no. So she's fresh out of school and had been put in charge of something quite complicated, to say the least. And being out in Baghdad traffic, uh, the need was apparent. Most officials there were on three-month contracts. 
as soon as somebody would develop the appropriate relationships with the Iraqis, in 90 days, 100 days, 120 days, they'd go home. And that is a terrible way to run an organization. There was a very strong um, preference on the, um, by the Pentagon to have American companies doing the work. And there are numerous instances where local Iraqi contractors proposed that they could do pieces of work for much, much less than, in fact, the uh, American contractors could have done. Ann and I took a very different approach to our work than many coalition units have because we worked very, very closely with the Iraqis. If we're sitting in a meeting, it was Americans um, and Iraqis, and the Iraqis had just as much say as we did. We were building border forts right next to forts being put up by the Army Corps of Engineers through that big American contractor, Parsons. I mean, we had our forts designed, built, and dedicated in a period of about five months. I think when we left, the Parsons forts, which had been started maybe a year before we arrived, were still not finished. The military officers would often be out in the field expending the, the, the small amount of funds that they had for immediate action to, say, clean up the street, uh, affect some temporary uh, improvements in the sewage system. Once the military had expended its small amount of money to do that, it would come back to CPA. We need this, this, and this for these projects, and it's going to cost this much and so forth. And it would disappear. It would simply disappear. What happened to my request? Uh, what request? <laughs> and this happened over and over again. This $18 billion that was committed by Congress uh, was really misconceived and misspent, if it was spent at all. We expect to produce enough electricity for all Iraqis to have electrical service 24 hours daily, something essential to their hopes for the future. There was fraud, there was corruption, um, there was waste. The ordinary people have their electricity only for two or three hours a day. Water comes every, like now and then, every two or three days. We spent winter shivering, covered in blankets, because we didn't have enough fuel to operate the um, heaters. That's, that's, that's the life we live. In May 2003, the United Nations sent its best expert in post-war reconstruction to help the U.S. occupation. He was a Brazilian diplomat named Sergio Vieira de Mello. Even though the U.N. was given nothing meaningful to do, Kofi Annan said, let me send my best. If anybody can carve out a bigger role for the U.N., it's my guy. It's Sergio Vieira de Mello. You know, I was part of his team. You know, I was his principal political advisor you know, at that time, and we went together to Baghdad. Our political team were all Arabic speakers and with good experience working in, in the region and so on. One of the things that Sergio did that is very, very poignant in retrospect is that seeing that the United States had boarded itself up in the green zone and was not accessing the Iraqi street, Sergio created a structure in Iraq that was precisely the opposite of the green zone. You might call it the anti-green zone. I'm listening. I'm listening to political uh, leaders. You know that I'll be meeting with them on a daily basis. We had various discussions with this military who came to the UN and met with Sergio Vieira de Mello and asked him you know, to mediate you know, in the dispute that they have with the CPA. You'd have these long, long lines right outside the green zone, but they could not make their complaints felt. In, in the UN compound, by contrast, it was incredibly porous. If you wanted to complain, the UN was, was very, very eager to hear your complaint, and Sergio saw it as his role to relay those complaints to Bremer at the highest levels in the hopes that some of these things would get tended to before an insurgency uh, took root. I'm meeting with him regularly and sharing my advice and my experience with him. As soon as Bremer had made use of Sergio, had made use of the UN, uh, he had almost no time uh, for the United Nations. And so what Sergio lived through was two months of, in effect, being used as a vehicle to get to certain segments of the Iraqi society, 
And then for his last month, what he endured was not having his phone calls returned. And so on issues like detention policy, uh, hoodings was one of the, the issues that Sergio raised again and again with Bremer and with General Sanchez, the hoodings of prisoners. Bremer would hear none of it. The three or four crucial months after the fall of Baghdad, the two main things the U.S. military was doing on the ground were looking for WMD supplies and looking for Saddam Hussein. The process of those searches, busting in the doors at night, rounding up people, taking them to Abu Ghraib, having mass arrests, had a really embittering effect. If you happen to be a military-aged Iraqi in an area of operation where the American military went into, there was a good chance you were going to be arrested or interned as a suspected insurgent just for being a military-aged man in, the, in that area of operation. In many occasions, you take the, you know, the Iraqi man of military age out of his family, you're taking the breadwinner. You anger not just him, but you anger an extended family, because he's probably supporting more than his immediate family. Whenever they uh, hear the American uh, helicopters or American tanks driving in their street, they immediately wake up, uh, even if it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, and prepare themselves for the detention. Because uh, for them, this is a usual thing happening even now. And there were attacks on the American soldiers themselves. And so they responded to those attacks by going out and trying to find the insurgents. And in going out and trying to find the insurgents, they sometimes arrested the wrong person. They even sometimes killed the wrong person. Uh, once people were arrested, they tended to disappear in the American military prison system for a long time without a trace. Their families couldn't get any word of them. It's difficult to understand what it feels like to be an occupied person. They point their guns at you from their jeeps. They stop you when you're driving. Iraqis would not understand instructions given to them at traffic checkpoints. They would approach too quickly. They would get shot and killed. Most of the American units that I've spent time with have tried very, very hard to always do the right thing and to not kill anyone or injure anyone they haven't um, intended to or needed to. Uh, but there's no question that, that wars are messy, and this one in Iraq with the way the insurgency is being waged is particularly so. One after another, you had these, these sort of short-term decisions, which by the end of 2003 meant you had a country with an insurgency underway. And in our land party that serve in the north, we found that Russian-made truck pulled up right outside Sergio Villardamela's window and set off just a huge amount of explosives. The entire southwestern corner of the UN building collapsed. Sergio was under the rubble and alive for more than three hours awaiting rescue. We lost many colleagues, you know, in that bombing, and I think it was, you know, the sign that something dramatic had happened in the country, you know, the insurgency had become very lethal, full-fledged, ready for a long struggle and long fight, you know, with the coalition forces. By 2004, the relationship between the military and the Iraqi people had grown toxic. <laughs> 
All right, this is the corner where uh, little shits like to throw rocks at. Right there. Oh, but we can't use deadly force. We can't use deadly force. You just fuck. Fuck you. You little shit. You see um, all these civilians who come over to work for um, the private contractors who are doing so much of the work with the reconstruction, really just because we don't have enough troops. Uh, these guards, they have special guards. I don't know who are these people they have brought here and so on. They have the right to shoot people, just like that. I've seen an awful lot of civilian contractors who have been uh, particularly violent and, um, and, and very short-sighted in terms of what they're doing. صدام يعني كان محاربنا بالسابق صحيح وهذا شيء ما نكره لكن اللي اجى اسوء من صدام اللي اجى اسوء من صدام لانه واحد اذا خربط هاي الشغله لازم يصفطها يلا يطلع فما يعوفونه هيك يرتبون الامور يلا يطلعون في اي لحظه تصير لي فرصه ان احارب امريكا مع السلاح باي حاجه did he already fight the Americans? By early 2004, Fallujah, a city of 350,000 people west of Baghdad, had become the center of the Sunni insurgency. On March 31st, 2004, four American military contractors were killed and their bodies were dragged through the streets of Fallujah by cheering crowds. Beginning in early 2004, the National Intelligence Council, a powerful 12-person committee that sits on top of America's intelligence community, conducted several assessments of the growing insurgency, which it presented to the White House and senior administration officials. Well, we were chronicling what was a deepening insurgency. It was broadening and it was not limited to foreign fighters or disaffected Ba'athists. What we call the insurgency really is a multifaceted, deeply rooted thing. Uh, it's not just a few Ba'athist dead-enders, it's not just a, a few uh, extremists from overseas, uh, but rather reflected uh, multiple motivations and frustrations among the Iraqi people themselves. As the economic situation was deteriorating, as people's personal security was becoming weaker, and as resentment of the American occupation was growing. The CIA uh, uh, laid out a, uh, several scenarios. It said it, life could be lousy, life could be okay, life could be better. The president hadn't read it, not even the one-page summary over which we worked so hard to reduce these findings to a single readable page. The president had not read even the executive summary. Correct. And they were just uh, uh, guessing as to what the conditions might be like. What's your estimate of the, of the number of people in Iraq who have been active at some level in the insurgency? Active in some level, uh, if, they, if you say supporting, providing safe haven to uh, potentially you know, well over 100,000 people. <laughs> Despite the intensification of the insurgency, there were still not sufficient armored vehicles for American soldiers in Iraq. We never had a single armored Humvee while we were in Iraq throughout 2003. We went to Iraq in 2004 with unarmored Humvees and they were given armor kits in Kuwait. 
which were just sort of cut out doors with no windows um, and a bulletproof windshield. And, and that's about it. If your Humvee hadn't been armored, what do you think the damage from that IED would have been? I think it would have been deadly. Why do we soldiers have to dig through local landfills for pieces of scrap metal and compromised ballistic glass to up armor our vehicles? And why don't we have those resources readily available to us? It, it's, it's essentially a matter of physics. It isn't a matter of money. It isn't a matter on the part of the Army of desire. It's, it's a matter of production and, and capability of doing it. We have automobile plants closing down in America, you know? I mean, I, I'm, not an, I'm not a factory expert. Just retool them to, to produce some armored Humvees. It shouldn't be that difficult. You go to war with the Army you have, uh, not the Army you might want or wish to have at a later time. In November 2004, the Pentagon decided to attack Fallujah in an attempt to recapture the city from the Sunni insurgency. Fallujah's 350,000 residents were warned to leave. The battle destroys 70% of the city and renders 150,000 people homeless. Despite intense combat, many insurgents escape. 40 Marines are killed. While the U.S. military was preoccupied with Fallujah, Shiite militias were taking over southern Iraq. There's nothing like an army or a, a major, um, large elements of hundreds of people trying to overthrow or, or to change the situation. In August 2004, the holy city of Najaf is taken over by the Mahdi army, the Shiite militia controlled by Muqtada al-Sadr. Essentially, the turnover we got from the army unit that we replaced was that most things in Najaf are pretty peaceful, uh, except there's this 3,000-man militia force that occupies the center of the city. A lot of rounds flying, a lot of mortars landing. My platoon was the, the first into the police station. We just took up positions alongside the Iraqi police and defended it from the militia. But it wasn't until the end of August that we actually did a full-scale assault on the old city of Najaf and took it over. If democracy cannot provide for the Iraqi people, people will say, to help this democracy, we need a strong man. And I can see the strong man already in the offing. His name is Muqtada Sadr. And I would say this is not a good choice for the future leader of Iraq. Were you part of the deliberations about whether to capture or kill Muqtada al-Sadr? Uh, yes, I was. Did we see Muqtada al-Sadr as a troublemaker and a thorn in the side? Absolutely. And we wanted to arrest him. It, was, it gets back, in my view, to the matter of troop strength. The uh, U.S. military didn't want to be diverted from their major mission to go after what would have been a, a probably short-term but difficult uh, and, and I'm sure bloody uh, battle. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, that's what won out. After elections were held in Iraq on December 15, 2005, the United Iraqi Alliance, of which Muqtada al-Sadr's party is a major participant, took nearly half the seats in Iraq's central government. That's not easy being a Marine who's some of, you know, some of my buddies were killed by him and his militia, and now looking at Iraq and seeing him as a rising politician. That's frustrating. Another Shiite group within Sadr's alliance is Skiri, the Supreme Council for Islamic Revolution in Iraq. Skiri's leadership lived in Iran for 20 years and is frequently pro-Iranian. These two Shiite groups, which sometimes engage in armed combat with each other, are politically allied against Sunni groups. Muqtada al-Sadr's Mahdi army continues to clash with U.S. forces. The level of activity that we see today from a military standpoint, I think, will clearly decline. I think they're in the, in the last throes, if you will, of the insurgency. When Secretary uh, Rumsfeld and, and Vice President Cheney made their comments about the insurgency dying out, uh, being a few dead-enders, etc., you knew that the intelligence estimates 
already indicated that they were wrong. I had been to Iraq eight times. I knew what the facts on the ground were. Uh, they'll have to speak, and they will be judged by their own words and actions, but uh, I knew what the facts were. Starting in 2005, the administration slowly began to correct some of its mistakes. It accelerated training of the Iraqi army and appointed a Muslim diplomat, Zalmay Khalilzad, as ambassador. In June of 2006, Ambassador Khalilzad sent an ominous cable to Condoleezza Rice. Iraqis working for the embassy could not tell their families where they worked for fear of being killed. They ask what will happen if the Americans evacuate. Many plan ahead for their own abduction. Six months later, the day after Republicans lose control of Congress, President Bush announces Donald Rumsfeld's resignation. The new Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, is a pragmatist who had been privately critical of the war. I am making a change at the Secretary of Defense to bring a fresh perspective as to how to achieve something I think most Americans want, which is a victory. By the time Rumsfeld is replaced, Iraq is out of control. The country is increasingly dominated by militias, insurgents, criminals, and warlords. Mixed areas are purged by ethnic cleansing. Shiite militias have infiltrated the police, using them for sectarian killings. Kidnappings and violent deaths have reached several hundred per day. <laughs> You have so many kinds of militia. You have the Mahdi militia, you have the Badr militia, you have many militias in this country. And they all are uh, very democratic in uh, arresting people and killing them. Security is terrible in, in many neighborhoods where the ever-present threat of car bombs and IEDs. Kidnappings, especially. Sheer money-making gangster stuff. Kidnapping of a, of a small boy right in front of the hotel. You know, a car just stopped, grabbed the boy, and drove off. Parents will get a ransom note, and they'll somehow have to raise this amount of money in a week. It's not where you just have one or two or three kidnappings, but you have hundreds, and you get overwhelmed. <laughs> just have a deluge of, of individuals who are asking for help or, or, or soon don't ask for help anymore. Why report it to the police? One, we don't trust them. Two, they may be committing some of the crime. The uniforms that they use just proliferated all over the place. So you really have lots of rogue elements and people that are using or working under the guise of the security services. Now you can see people arrested by many sources. We don't know who are they. Fake checkpoints in the streets stop people passing and look into their IDs and see if they were Shiites, Sunnis, Kurds, Arabs, and then either kidnap them or kill them in the same place. When I say goodbye to my husband, I think I'm not coming back. By late 2006, Baghdad had fallen into near anarchy. The US military controlled the green zone and the area around Baghdad airport. Iraqi security forces controlled areas in the east and south. The Sunni militias controlled several predominantly Sunni neighborhoods. Muqtada al-Sadr's Mahdi army dominated large areas, including the enormous Shiite slum of Sadr city. Skiri's rival Shiite militia, the Badr Brigade, controlled wealthier Shiite areas. Neighborhood organizations controlled many small zones. Large areas were essentially controlled by no one. From a study conducted by Harvard professor Linda Bilmes and Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, as of early 2007, the U.S. has spent $379 billion directly on the war in Iraq. Future operating costs are estimated at $389 billion. 
the costs of veterans' health care and lost productivity of those serving in Iraq is $482 billion. The costs of demobilization and replacing military equipment, which is being used up six times faster than normal, is $160 billion. The increase in oil prices due to the war have cost the U.S. economy $450 billion. In total, the economic cost of the war is projected to reach $1.8 trillion. I'm suffering from post-traumatic migraines and post-traumatic epilepsy. Uh, sometimes I have bad memories about what happened, but I'm not scared of them. Do you feel emotionally okay? Um, sometimes that's a little... Um, sometimes yeah, sometimes no. Still have trouble, you know, dealing with them. Um, you know, it's what happened to me and my partner, you know, sometimes. The big, big cost in terms of veterans' disability is for the many hundreds of thousands of people who come back and they find that they can't work and hold down a job in the way they used to because they're just not quite the same as they were before. How hot does it get in this country? 120 yesterday? Oh. Last contract I ever signed with the government. <laughs> some of these units have been there now on their third tour of duty, and uh, some of them don't see an end to it. They think they'll be back there for their fifth, sixth, and seventh tours of duty before this ends. We don't have enough troops. How could we protect against a possible conflict in Pyongyang, a possible conflict with Iran, other potentialities in the world, when we've got everything tied up with regard to Iraq and Afghanistan? Iran is uh, oddly, uh, given uh, how much we dislike the Iranian regime, the single greatest beneficiary of the war in Iraq. We eliminated their historic enemy for them and put them on top in the Persian Gulf. I mean, when you have massive civil war, violent, nasty civil war on top of 20% of the world's oil supply that will probably engulf other regional players, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Syria, maybe even Egypt. If Iraq disintegrates and becomes an arena of civil war, much of it will become like little Afghanistan. It's where uh, terrorists all over the world will find refuge. If Iraq goes back to some sort of Islamo-fascist regime like we had in, under the Taliban in Afghanistan, then we are back for September the 10th, 2001, except at a much larger scale and you know, with billions of dollars in oil mining in their disposal. When we were first starting the reconstruction, we would sort of joke that there were 500 ways to do it wrong and two or three ways to do it right. And what we didn't understand is that we were going to go through all 500. Why do you think all those mistakes were made? I don't know. I have no idea. Puzzling. President Bush was missing in action on the planning for the post-war. He deferred to his vice president and his secretary of defense the control over those decisions. Why on earth, if you were president of the United States, would you plan to use military force and then divorce yourself from, essentially, the most important aspect of that use, and that is the aftermath. Who is in charge of this war? I don't want to go through the list. I mean, it was, it was the president, the vice president, secretary of defense, those around, around all those people. Do you include a national security advisor? Sure. Uh, the vice president you include? Yeah. That was the inner team that produced uh, the thinking behind the war. My mistake was probably not finding a way to get myself more involved on the planning process of things. I see so that the dissolution of the army wouldn't have been a surprise, right. for example. Well, and I could have raised hell about it, you know, and had my day in court. I may have lost, but I'd had my day in court. Yeah. The system ought to be participatory and ought to include people who are willing to say, uh, this, this makes no sense, Mr. President. This is a bad idea. And I don't think that kind of decision-making process existed in the Bush administration. I certainly didn't feel myself participating in such a decision-making process. The administration never asked for any uh, estimate or community assessment on Iraq before we went to war. Nobody seemed to be interested in what the community had to say? I think it's more a matter that minds were made up, the, time, the course was set. Uh, whatever 
analysis on these sorts of issues was to have been done. The decision makers felt they had already done it themselves. Vice President Cheney, of course, has made, uh, takes many of the same positions that uh, Secretary Rumsfeld did on the war. Does he still have your complete confidence? Yes, he and does. Do you expect him to stay the campaign is over? Term? Yes, he does. And he'll be here for the remainder yes, of the term? Yes, he will. There are nights when I don't sleep very well that I fault myself for not pushing the issue, that I think I should have gone and kicked his door in and said, damn it, listen, this was a mistake. We need to do something to rectify it. But I never had the opportunity to do it. And trying to kick in a door, you know, with an ambassador who's uh, essentially the, you know, the czar of, of Iraq, you know, for a colonel to try and do it just wasn't going to happen. You couldn't get past the front door. If my speaking out adds even in, infinitesimally to the criticism that counts of this administration, then that's good. Uh, I don't pretend to say that I've, I've been effective in that regard, but I, I just can't hold my peace any longer. We will bring to the Iraqi people food and medicines and supplies and freedom. Just was Henny Penny, the sky is falling. General Garner and I are pledged to working very closely together. There is a large number of uh, former Iraqi soldiers that are unemployed now. One was uh, guerrilla war, another was insurgency, another was uh, unconventional war. Pardon me? What? <laughs> no, that's uh, someone else's business, quagmires. I don't do quagmires. I'm listening. I'm listening to political uh, leaders. Someday in my life, in the future, I got to look back to Iraq and I got to see something done in there so I can look back and say, I was part of this and my suffering and my loss have a, have a meaning. If the situation gets better, I am going to leave Iraq. I will leave Iraq, but now I'm a fighter. I mean, all my life, I won't leave Iraq now. From here, we can't change anything because it's, it's out of control now. I don't have future plans for being in Iraq. I don't see the uh, bit of light in the, uh, at the end of the tunnel yet. This is what it is. This is how we live it. This is how we see it. This is how we smell it and feel it. It's not a situation that you can say, let's try this, it will help. Let's try this, it will help. No, it's not. And are you telling me that's the best America can do? No. Don't, don't tell me that. Don't tell the, the Marines who fought for a month in Najaf that. Don't tell the Marines who, who are still fighting every day in Fallujah that that's the best America can do. That makes me angry.